Hi, I'm Andy with EcoCha, and here we are with batch number 28 of the EcoCha Tea Club. And this month's batch is a roasted leaf hopper high mountain oolong tea. It's the roasted version of last November's batch, harvested in June of last year following the spring harvest. So this batch was left unsprayed and as a result was affected by the green leaf hopper, the bug that is responsible for the creation of oriental beauty, Dong Fan Mei Ren, or Gui Fei Cha, uh, concubine tea, or as it is more commonly known now, in general, bug bitten tea, which is a more direct translation of the Taiwanese dialect, E Na Te. Um, so, uh, we as club members know what the unroasted uh, batch tasted like, very vibrant, very full flavored, uh, fresh, but with a lot of complexity. And then we asked Abao, our friend who we sourced this batch of tea from, to roast the remainder. This roasted version has an even stronger character than the unroasted, so it is uh, worthwhile to pay attention to the amount of tea leaves being used and how long you brew it. It can uh, get strong on you if you're not careful. While I'm brewing the Gong Fu uh, brew, the tea in the Gong Fu teapot, I'm also going to uh, brew with a French press for a change because I'm just curious uh, to see how it brews with a smaller amount of tea leaves for a longer amount of time which is what we recommend for this type of brewing method. So I just put in almost seven grams. This is about a 180 milliliter pot. It's on the larger side for Gong Fu teapots. And the French press is about 400 milliliters. So I'm going to go with about four and a half grams, just that amount. Typically, I would suggest, you know, six, seven, possibly even eight grams, depending on the type of tea, and let it go for a few minutes. But I'm going to use uh, four and a half grams and let it brew for the time that we're talking here and uh, see what kind of results we get. It's really, I'm also finding varying. Uh, varying characters with each brew. I've probably brewed this tea definitely more than 10 times. And I've gotten from off the aroma, off the rinse, has started with uh, baked carrots, buttered carrots, kind of that uh, very sweet, uh, sweet potato or yams, baked yams. This one, I, that whiff that I just got from the pit, teapot sitting here was definitely that honey essence of a bug bitten tea. Closer up, it's a bit of a pastry aroma. Sweet. Mmm. Exciting. So, uh, that's what I have to say most fundamentally about this tea. Is its complexity is not only in a sip of it, but it's in its variation in my experience of brewing it from time to time. I'm still learning about it and learning from it. And uh, I find that fun and uh, intriguing that a tea can do that. And that, um, in my experience of bug bitten teas in general, my running theory, oh yeah, I'm gonna put some water in here while we're talking. Uh, my running theory is, if you think about the growing season and the fact that it's the effect of these tiny insects feeding to an endless variation of uh, impact on these leaf buds. So every leaf theoretically is affected to a different extent. And I imagine that within a large plot of tea, certain areas of the tea garden are affected more than others, or maybe per plant or per branch, you know, it's, it's, you're talking on a kind of micro level here. So, uh, the point I'm getting at is that I've experienced uh, bug bitten tea to vary, the same bag of tea to vary from brew to brew. And that is how I've uh, reached this running theory, uh, is that I think you get different concentrations of the bug bitten effect with each brew, depending on which leaves come out of your bag at a given session. So the farmer has to kind of look at the overall crop and, and see this variation, try to assess the spectrum of oxidation that he can visually assess by the freshly picked leaves, and then coax them along uh, to the best of his knowledge and skill or her knowledge and skill. 
And that's the real art of bug bitten tea. And it's why, until recently at least, uh, farmers didn't want to deal with a crop of bug bitten tea because it's difficult and it's a gamble. And you never know what the effect or the, the outcome will be. Hmm. Nice balance. I think I, I did well, even though I'm talking while I'm doing this. In terms of determining the extent of the brew, it's not overly brewed at all, but it has enough substance, a very uh, balanced and smooth character in the first brew. Kind of a pastry flavor. Now, as I'm breathing through my nose, I get that, that sweetness. It's a very interesting type of sweetness. It's obviously not a sugary sweet. It's all about the aromatic oils giving us the experience of what we have learned to call sweet. Mm. Floral and honey with, uh, with a kind of finish of a freshly baked scone, that uh, pastry sweetness. So I, uh, I think probably the most uh, influential factor is the amount of leaves. 180 milliliter pot, this is uh, under seven grams about six and a half grams, considerably less amount of leaves than I would use if I were brewing a Dongding Oolong or a Tie Guanyin Oolong or an unroasted High Mountain Oolong. So these leaves have a lot of, uh, a lot of power to their punch, so to speak, and you've got to handle them uh, with finesse. Hmm. Stronger brew the second time. I've been letting the third brew go for a while now. Uh, more of a, a bolder, a little bit of a fruity character, and definitely more balance of bitter there. But uh, it's vibrant. That's the word that keeps coming to me uh, to try to describe the, the floral or fruity or sweet qualities combined with the bitter and astringent qualities that are inherent in tea. I think that it's like a finish of uh, a good wine, that dry finish is what really kind of satisfies and stimulates on a different level than something that's just plain sweet or smoky or other uh, flavor characteristics that come out. A really nice complexity um, with enough balance and smoothness. The roast, on a light roasted oolong, what normally happens is the fresh green qualities, the very, very fragrant qualities, get taken down and become sweeter, but definitely a little bit flatter and uh, more mellowed. But a, a fuller body, a smoother texture results as well. And I believe that's what we have achieved with this batch. Definitely a thicker, smoother texture to the tea. The very vibrant character that was in the unroasted uh, batch that we shared in November is still there, but more kind of just more well-rounded. And I think the bug bitten effect is more noticeable uh, with the roast. It, it gets that sweet pastry kind of character that is closer to being a concubine. Uh, we achieved our goal in terms of wanting to share the difference between an unroasted leaf hopper high mountain oolong and a roasted leaf hopper high mountain oolong to see what happens as a result of roasting but not to make the roasting so blatant that you only taste the roasted character which is not so uncommon in the industry here people roast tea to the point where the complexity is lost the the expertise and the finesse is finding what level of roasting is appropriate for each batch of tea, given its, uh, given its personality before it's roasted. So we'd love to hear what you think. Uh, please uh, share your experiences uh, and comparisons between the unroasted and roasted batches. And if you haven't signed up on our YouTube channel, uh, while you're here watching this video or before you click off, please go ahead and sign up. And uh, thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next month.